This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Um, this chapter is looking at divisional performance measurement. And the first of all, be clear what we mean by a division. A division, because people often use the word wrongly uh, in general conversation, but a division it's where the manager has autonomy to make decisions. And what I mean by autonomy, um, and I've written that word deliberately because the word could be mentioned, uh, autonomy means that they have the power to make decisions themselves. Uh, for example, uh, I may have a um, tuition company based in one city and I'm in charge and I decide we're going to open an office in another city. There are two ways I can go about it. I can either open the uh, office in the other city and all right, it needs somebody there to um, uh, check that the doors are open in the morning and so on. But I will make all the decisions. I'll decide on selling prices, I'll decide on who we employ, and so on. That wouldn't be a division. What would make it a division would be where I appointed a manager to run this other office and gave them the power to make decisions, the power to run, uh, run it as though it was their own little company. It's having that power to make decisions, the autonomy, that makes it a, a division. And so uh, they can decide on what prices to charge, who to employ and so on. They don't have to check back with me, even though I'm in charge of the whole company. Uh, advantages, disadvantages. The advantages, if the manager there is able to make their own decisions, uh, that stands to be uh, faster decision making. You know, if a customer uh, asks for a special quote or something, they can decide what to quote. They don't have to come back to me and there be a delay while I make the decision. Uh, more local knowledge. Maybe in this other city, uh, people think differently. A local manager understands the customers better, perhaps, than I do. Uh, and, of course, more motivating for the manager. Um, if you're given responsibility um, for running your bit of the business, and you're going to be rewarded as a result if you do well. I think you're far more likely to be motivated than if it's me controlling everything. So those are the main advantages of having a division. And incidentally, division doesn't have to be geographical. I gave you an example. I have an office here and I have another office in another city. Uh, but within the same building, you know, we could be a firm of accountants. Uh, and there's... Um, Part of the business is doing audits, uh, another part of the business is doing tax. Well, if both bits of it have managers who are able to make their own decisions, we've got autonomy, then there are divisions. And of course, I may be in charge of the whole business, but the person in charge of the tax division knows much more about tax and what they need to offer customers and so on than I do. Uh, again, faster decision making. Here, local knowledge is knowledge of the particular area, and so on. Uh, disadvantage, there's really one big, I'm not sure disadvantage is the right word, but one um, big thing that needs considering what the rest of the chapter is really on, is how to measure performance. of the division uh, and coupled with 
how to ensure goal congruence. Uh, and I'll explain that term uh, in a second. But how oh dear, to measure uh, performance of the division. It may seem terribly obvious that, oh, well, I open um, uh, a, a, a teaching office in another city. How am I going to measure if the manager is doing well? It may seem obvious that, uh, you know, if they make more profit, it's good. If they make less profit, it's bad. But it's not quite that simple. Uh, I need uh, a way of measuring the performance and presumably I will reward the manager accordingly. But if I simply said this, make more profit and I'll give you a bonus, make less profit and we'll sack you. So let me give you one example of a problem that could occur. I have two teaching offices, one in this city, one in another city, which isn't that far away. The divisional manager, I've told him, if he increases profit, he'll get a bonus. The danger is what he might do is say, oh, how can I get more students and therefore make more profit? I'll charge less. And if he charges less than we're charging in my city, the danger is he simply steals students from me. That may mean he makes more profit and I'm forced to give him his bonus. But that's not good for the company as a whole. There's only one company. And simply getting stealing students from one office to go to another office isn't going to make more profit for the company as a whole. And that's what I mean by goal congruent. Goal congruence means same aim. We've got to make sure that we uh, measure the performance in a way that's what's good for the manager of that division is good for the company as a whole. Because, I mean, he doesn't really care about the rest of the company. He's focusing on his division. And again, if I just say, we want more profit, that's all he cares about. So I've got to be very, very careful how we decide we're going to measure the performance so that what he wants to do for his division is automatically good for the company as a whole. Now, over the page is more about that, and I'm not going to read that whole paragraph to you. But it's very much saying what I was just saying here. Design measures of performance, that what's good for him is good for the company, and not just financial measures. Um, uh, as I spoke in the previous lecture, non-financial measures, how important it is um, that we maintain quality, for example. And so, in fact, what tends to happen is that we have a whole series of performance measures for the manager. Some involve financial, but, you know, we do obviously want more profits subject to this gold congruence business. But also... Um, measures on quality and so on, so that he's not simply focused on the short term, how can I make more profit and get my bonus, but for the benefit of the company as a whole, he's thinking more long term and trying to improve quality, and trying to improve efficiency, or whatever. Uh, paragraph four says controllable profits, this is a fairly obvious one. In that when you're measuring the performance of the manager, surely, if you're going to uh, be motivating and fair, you, can only, you should only measure them on things that they are in control of. And although I said division means we give them autonomy, um, for various reasons, we may not give them full autonomy. For instance, I'm prepared to um, let this manager have full decision-making power over everything except the salaries. Because maybe the two offices are too close together, it's, there's going to be too much problem if uh, my office is paying the staff hard, more or less than his office. And so it, we might decide we've got to have the same salary rises, you know, I can't put mine up at 10%, he puts his up at 2% or something. 
we decide we've got to have the same salary rises, so I'll talk to them and discuss it, and ultimately I'll decide what the salaries will be. Well, it would then be unfair to measure the manager on the profits after salaries, which he had no control over. When we came to measure his performance, we'd take out the salaries because I fixed them. It wasn't anything he could uh, do anything about. Uh, finally, for the um, what you might call the chatty bits, there are different types of division, um, of which paragraph five only really mentions one. Um, you can have a situation where it's simply uh, what we call a cost centre, where the manager is only responsible for the costs. You know, I may fix selling prices and so on. The manager only has responsibility for the costs. Well, fine, I'm not really worried for the exam. But you, uh, when you're measuring, you'd be very much looking at variances. You know, what costs were we budgeting on? Has he done better? Has he done worse? Uh, another type is a profit centre. And if it's a profit centre, then subject to it only being um, things that the manager can control, uh, that's a situation where the manager has autonomy over costs and revenues. So not only can they determine the cost, you know, they can decide what suppliers to use and so on, but in addition they control revenues, uh, they fix selling prices, they decide on what advertising to do. Whatever. However, the one we're concerned about for the arithmetic that follows is what's known as an investment centre. And if it's an investment centre, uh, the manager has autonomy again. over not only costs and revenues, uh, but also new capital investment. Now it's this that's the important one. Because okay, they control uh, costs, they can decide where to, um, what well, suppliers to use, uh, they control revenues, they can fix selling prices, etc. But they have uh, control over new capital investment. That if they decide they're going to spend 50000 on a new machine because it will generate bigger profits, well, it's their decision. They don't have to ask me, even though I'm in charge of the whole company. Now, to get a full autonomy in real life tends not to happen. What tends to happen is you set them a limit. You know, maybe um, if you want new machines and things, you can spend up to 10,000 without asking me. But over the limit, you have to ask me. But a full investment centre, <coughs> uh, they have full control. And that's when it starts to be more of a problem, certainly for the arithmetic, about how we're going to measure performance. Because, okay, I'm allowing them to buy new machines, but it's no good just saying, oh, <clears throat> I'll measure your performance on profit. If profit goes up, you get a bonus. If it goes down, you don't. Because that would mean <clears throat> if there was a new machine ooh, costing 100,000, if it was simply going to increase profit by 1,000, oh, fine, profit gone up, he has to have his bonus. But I'm certainly not happy for the company as a whole to be spending 100,000 on a machine that's only generating a profit of 1,000 a year. So it's here, this is what we're concerned about for the exam. How are we going to measure performance for that sort of centre? Okay, well, <coughs> I haven't talked much, but, <coughs> sorry. 
Uh, I will pause there, give you a chance to think about it and read those two pages. But then uh, we'll go through the two standard measures of performance we might use for an investment centre.